This is the Power Platform Brief. Everything you need to know about Microsoft's Power Platform in 20 minutes or less. I'm Brad Kuntz. I'm Joel Lindstrom. So Brad, what's been going on with the Power Platform lately? Joel, there's been a lot of news in the Power Platform. I think that uh, you you sent me a nice uh, admin white paper yesterday. I haven't had a chance to read it. Yeah, it's it's pretty good. It's over 100 pages long, so it's uh, it's not light reading. It covers a lot of things around governance, around both uh, Power Power Apps and Power Automate, including managing your DLP rules and other really good things. We'll put a link in the show notes, but uh, I thought it was really timely, especially because uh, we have some governance training for some customers coming up. And That's right. I'll be using I'll be using it to supplement things like the COE starter kit and things like that, just to make sure it's it's easy to get started with the Power Platform, but uh, a lot of people don't think about things like governance and how they control their data, and you really need to. So I'd uh, recommend you check that out. It seems to be a pretty hot topic. I know that we're, we're at a place where the Power Platform, where Microsoft, through their marketing, has done a very effective job of talking about enabling makers. And what that is is doing uh, kind of on the back end is making some people nervous about having a, an army of makers out there and, and asking the questions to, to partners like us. What is the, what's the plan for administration? What's the plan for governance and, and DLP? So, so that's good. Right. And some other, things, uh, some other things that are good to know is Microsoft has added the ability to add connections to, uh, to components in, in Power Apps. If you don't know components, components are ways for you to take pieces of Power Apps and be able to reuse them between apps. Up until now, custom connections have not been uh, included in that, but uh, that's available now. Um, there's also a very good uh, detailed blog post about the performance of Unified Interface uh, for Model Driven Apps and Dynamics. Um, we've noticed that they're a lot more performant than Classic UI, and everybody's thinking about Classic about the move to Unified Interface coming up later in 2020. Uh, but it's not just you're being forced to move; you're getting a lot of value out of that, and. Uh, it's going to optimize the way things load, and uh, and it's going to make it a better performant experience. Now that the unified interface has been out for two years or so, almost, uh, you know, it's 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 a much better experience. I haven't found one customer yet who has missed the classic UI once they get moved over. You know, something else, uh, Joel, that I noticed this week, a analyst from Evercore ISI uh, released a report that really gave a big shining light to the Power Platform. And, um, you know, like all these analysts, they're trying to, to figure out uh, kind of the why that, you know, if you look at Microsoft stock, it's risen, it's risen 50% this year. Uh, most of the analysts out there are talking about how that's driven by Azure without actually digging into what exactly does that mean. Uh, this analyst, Kirk uh, Matarin, uh talked about how, yeah, that was a big part of it, but he really put a light on the Power Platform offerings and um, talked about how it's the Power Platform that um, is going to remain a key focus area for the company and could also help inform their long-term M&A strategy. They believe Power Platform's value in terms of aligning Microsoft with digital transformation is an important part of the broader strategy. And while that's a lot of, you know, kind of Wall Street analyst uh, fluff to a certain degree, uh, I think it's important to know that that it's the power platform uh, that is starting to get some some traction as a reason uh, for for Microsoft's phenomenal success these days. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think that's one thing where some Dynamics people and Dynamics partners are still just a little bit confused about how what to do with the power platform. And that really is, it's the vehicle that is taking this to a broader audience. It takes it outside of the CRM world to just building apps. And that gets a lot more attention from both a, a new kind of customer as well as analysts that wouldn't have paid any attention to a CRM platform. Yeah, that's true. Some of them can't figure out what to do with it and can't figure out if it's just 
Uh, I would read one, I think Business Insider had an article where one of the analysts was saying that it was, they felt like it was just something Microsoft was doing to prop up their, their cloud offering. <laughs> right. But I think they haven't, they, they don't really understand what it is. So another interesting uh, stat that I saw this week was around the uh, the ongoing war between Microsoft Teams and Slack. Yeah. So um, I, you know, some people didn't know there was a war going on. <laughs> <laughs> there, 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 you always have to have a good guy and a bad guy in the in the uh, tech world, and I think we've uh, uh, we haven't had a real a real bad guy on the uh, for Microsoft because they have been doing so well with some of their current with some of their formal rivals like Apple and Salesforce and things like that. You've seen a little bit more of cooperation there. And there's there's they're also a partner of Slack too. Because That's right. Slack works well with Office and other products. That's right. Uh, and, and and that was one of the points that the uh, that the folks over at Slack keep talking about is that the majority of their customers do use the Microsoft Office suite every right. day and they choose to use Slack instead of Teams. Uh, the, the the stat that came out in November uh, said when Microsoft reported that Teams now has 20 million daily active users uh, compared to 12 million Slack users. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think for me, they, they kind of answer different questions. I mean, if you are going to have an ad hoc group just spin up a collaboration area, Slack still has some advantages there. You know, the Teams works well, really well in a corporate environment where everybody's on the same network. Um, it hasn't quite got as smooth for working with external users yet, especially if you have people at five different companies. Switch, you have to switch the environment you're working in Teams. So that's where, again, I've, I actually use both. At work, I use Teams, but for some private collaboration groups with people in, say, an organization or your church or wh whatever, you know, your T Slack has some advantages there because it's free, you can spin it up. But, um, you know, I think for the for the enterprise world, I think Teams is definitely winning. Well, great. What else do you have, Joel, from this week? Oh, just uh, really nothing else. It's kind of it's kind of uh, the lull before the uh, the wave one uh, information comes out for 2020. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, I have been playing with some of the some of the preview features and other things like that. Um, some of the omni-channel stuff is looking really good. Um, I saw some information about the Facebook integration with omni-channel, and I see for certain types of businesses that will have uh, have uh, some really nice applications. Well, that's great. Well, this will be our last episode. Uh, it being a couple days before Christmas. Yeah. So this will be our last one for the year. Uh, I did have a chance this week to sit down with Scott Millwood. Who both of us know, I know very that guy. well. Yeah, we know that guy. Uh, so we got a, sit, a chance to sit down with him and talk about his new venture called YesFlow. Yeah, YesFlow has it looks pretty exciting, especially with the uh, with uh, the voice applications of it. Um, I noticed that you know recently at Dreamforce that Salesforce talked about how voice is the future. So I guess you could say Scott and YesFlow are trailblazers. That's right. That's right. Well, here's that interview. <laughs> So Scott Millwood, thanks for joining us today. Happy to be here, Brad. So YesFlow, Enterprise Digital Assistant, uh, just kicked this off. How old? Uh, how long have you been doing YesFlow? How long have you guys had your doors open? So we started this about uh, 18 months ago as an idea. Actually, probably the idea uh, came before that, but uh, we really started working on it in earnest about 18 months ago. We pulled the team together about a year ago, and we've been in hardcore development with uh, five developers for the past year. Okay. We now have commercial grade product and uh, out with customers. And uh, you know, it's it's a tough process to build a product. Right, I know, I know. Um, you said that you were looking to find a problem to fall in love with. Yeah, how, to, yeah how, how, right. How, how'd that end up right, for you? Right, You know, if I reflect back on our experience with Customer Effective and then Hitachi and working with so many enterprise CRM implementations over many, many years. The thing that we saw over the course of time is that we could get really good traction with some users, but those users that were out mobile 
face to face with customers, planes, trains, and automobiles every day, really tough users. And, and we saw that as the problem. And it's a problem I feel, you know, I'm out talking to customers on the road and it's tough to be a really good quote unquote CRM user when you're mobile. Uh, so that's the problem we fell in love with uh, from our own experience. And we validated that as the uh, early days of getting this out of the ground by going out and talking to lots and lots of our old customers, people we had implemented CRM for and asking them, you know, what's the big pain? And the big pain we found was lack of engagement at the, at the CRM user level. So still that's the problem. It's that, it's that lack of user adoption, last lack of meaningful adoption. That is it. Yep. That is it. You know, there's uh, uh, this feeling of big brother. CRM is you know, not for the sales rep. It's for the sales manager. And, and you know, a lot of the end users some really feel like, uh, you know, this is something that management wants me to do, not something good for me. We saw that as an opportunity and see it as an opportunity that if we can flip that around and sort of change the quid pro quo so that it's good for the user, there's something in it for them, then they will use CRM every day. So you know, what we've done with YesFlow is we've built an enterprise digital assistant, which is you know, something that you can think of as analogous to a Siri or Alexa that holds the user's hand through the experience of being a productive seller, using CRM, sending email, making calls, sending text, keeping up with all the details about accounts, contacts, deals, and anything else that they need to do. The, uh, the, the challenge we had in putting all this together, of course, is that we had to have an experience that was really, really satisfying for the user, giving them what they want when they want it. And we set a goal to be the fastest easiest CRM experience ever made. And fast means millisecond timing. Uh, and so what we figured out is that uh, we could build a very lightweight assistant technology that uh, uh, you know, isn't trying to reproduce CRM, but is giving you just a little snippet of CRM and guiding you along the way in a, in a text style experience. So you're familiar with texting back and forth with your right. wife, Lauren. Right. You have that back and forth exchange. Think of YesFlow as your assistant on the other end. It's the same sort of thing. You're having this back and forth experience, but you're getting these rich cards of information back from your CRM system, and you're updating that by text or better by voice. Just touch the big orange button and talk. Boom, you've added a note. Touch the big orange button, ask for an account contact record. Boom, you've got it right there in front of you. So you're not recreating CRM. You're, in no way. Right. Yeah. You're, you're working with CRM. We're right. 100% complementary to CRM. In yep. fact, our prospects have to have CRM. We're not out trying to you know, it sell somebody on CRM. The best users of YesFlow are people who've had CRM for three, four, five years where they really feel the pain of not getting their user base to be delighted and engaged every day. Our goal with the fastest, easiest CRM experience ever made is daily active users. And we think we get to daily active users by providing this experience that's more like a consumer app. It right. feels rich and delightful to use and the users use it every day. It's a little bit of a change because I can remember when I started working with you 10 years ago, yeah. it was just user adoption. That was the KPI. And, and we would measure, and different customers were different, but we would measure it as did they, did they access CRM during a given month, right? right? And so right. now you're really truly taking that consumer approach to say that the, the key metric for, for customer success here is daily active users. Daily, right, yeah. daily. And, and we're looking at the frequency in the day. Right. Uh, and if we're doing our job right and giving them that delightful experience, they should be using it many, many, many times during the day, just as you might use text many, many times during the day. Right, right, well, that's cool. So, so what, is, what has changed in the last few years that has made this approach possible? Because like I said, 
the the old metric of did they turn it on? Yeah. Did they log in? I remember looking at did, did they ever get the right, right, instant right, set up? Right. But but what's changed with the technology stack uh, that's made this possible? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So you know if you think back, uh, not even that long ago, it, it's fields on forms with modules, uh, and and that's what we had. Those were the tools we had to work with, and you know we 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 bent those forms left, right, and sideways and called it XRM. Um, the thing that's really changed in the past three years is the advent of AI. And, and we saw that what we could do with a digital assistant around automated speech recognition and natural language understanding had reached a threshold where it would actually work. So, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but um, the category of voice assistant like Alexa that you have in your home is the fastest adoption of any technology of all time. Okay. Faster than the internet, faster than, than uh, you know, uh, uh, PCs, faster Makes than sense. smartphones. Mm -hmm. So people love this because it's super, super easy. You can just talk and ask questions. That's the technology that really came along that, that opened the door to say, all I have to do is talk and my assistant can understand what I mean. Now, we're not inventing automated speech recognition. We're not inventing natural language understanding. We're leveraging that big category of AI from Microsoft. We're applying AI. And applying AI turns out to be pretty difficult too, as testament to our last year of development. Putting all of that together in a way that you're recognizing the voice on your iOS device or your Android device, you're converting that to text and then running that into an NLU, getting the right intent, and then in our case, the architecture goes out, looks at your CDS, queries back the data from CDS, and presents you back with a very lightweight uh, metadata-driven card into the assistant, and there's your response. All that has to happen in millisecond timing. And so that's the technology that's really there. It's a combination of AI, and the flexibility and, and strength of Azure and the flexibility and strength of the Power Platform. You put all those together and we've got technology that actually works now. And it is fast. I just saw it for the first time. It's, 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 that's the goal. It's, it's lightning fast. So you guys working through partners, I assume, through partners in the Microsoft Absolutely, space? absolutely. So you know, we've established our Lighthouse accounts direct through our kind of reference selling or, or really Rolodex selling back to customers that we had relationships from customer effective and Hitachi days. But beyond that, after Lighthouse, it's really to scale through partner relationships. And we've already established some good solid relationships back into partners. Partners seem very excited about what we're doing. Uh, it's a great way for a partner to go back into existing customers and sell them on something new, but also to take them back a solution to a problem that you know exists. We just had an experience not too long ago with a partner that opened the door to an account that had 1,800 sold Dynamics licenses. They looked at that and figured out that only 600 of them were using it on a monthly basis. There's a nasty true up coming in there right. if we can't go back to that customer and get daily active use. So we think the partner channel there is the absolute best way to do that. and we're working hard to make sure that we're a partner-friendly organization and working in tandem on how to land new accounts. So tell me about the team here at YesFlow. Well, phenomenal team. Um, I couldn't be you know, more uh, satisfied and happy with who we've been able to pull together. Um, you know, folks that we've worked with for 25 plus years, going back to DataStream and then to Customer Effective and then Hitachi, Michael Elliott, my co-founder that co-founded uh, Customer Effective with me and. 2004. Um, we've got Maverick Garrett, who's our CTO, Maverick, long time data stream, customer effective, Hitachi, ran a big development team for us at, uh, at customer effective, doing a great job and diving in and not just being a big CTO manager, but actually writing code every day. I saw him uh, walking you know, in. Yeah. Slinging yeah. it around and yeah. learning lots about climbing the learning curve uh, for the past year on, on uh, you know, AI and voice and iOS and Android development that uh, involves Lots of crazy stuff. We got Tap Haley as uh, our, our CSO, Chief Sales Officer, who ran the insurance vertical for us at, uh, 
at Customer Effective. Alex Farquharson, our VP of Customer Success, has uh, you know, been a Customer Effective guy, a Click Dimensions guy, a Tachi guy, doing a great job you know, hand-holding with the customers. And then the development team beyond that, uh, you know, we've, got, we've got a handful of folks that, again, they've all been with us for a number of years and, and working like a well-oiled machine in that we all know each other's strengths and weaknesses. We all know each other's uh, preferences for lunch. Uh, we all know each other's kids' names and uh, you know, pick right up where we left off and put the team back together, kind of get the band back together, right, I guess, is right. the phrase. Clemson going all the way? Man, yeah, hundred percent, hundred all the all the way. I've uh, I've never been more confident that we'll be a national champion. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm just trusting Dabo at this point. Like, right, whatever the man says, I believe it. Right, yeah. Yeah. right. I wish the dogs were going to be there I in, did in too. the fight too. We just weren't. Uh, it just wasn't our year. It wasn't the year. It wasn't the year. Keep waiting for that dogs been, and tigers I matchup. Know. I know. Yeah. Maybe next year. Maybe next year. Scott Millwood, thank you so much for talking to us. Brad, thank you. Delight to be here. Thanks, Brad. Um, Thanks for doing the podcast this year. It's exciting and glad to have you on the network. Absolutely, Joel. It's been a blast and look forward to more of these next year. Great. Have a good holidays.